Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon, dear folks. This is Tom Sonic again from Croatia, and welcome aboard. And I'm pleased to have a very special guest and a very special friend on my show, Dr. Christian Kopf. Uh, Chris, how are you doing? Thanks for being with me. It's great to talk to you. I'm doing well, and it's it's great to be on your show. Well, Chris, I, I must really, uh, I, you know, I'm. I'm truly uh, amazed with your work and with your with your academic uh, skills and, and, and certificates and what have you. And I and I'm, I'm, I must say I'm, I've been a little bit angry because I haven't heard from you for almost 25 years. <laughs> uh, when last time I saw was when was that seven years ago at that uh, Charles Martel Society meeting. Well, I'm sure that my audience uh, basically were dealing with younger folks and uh, students. They, they they certainly would be enthralled with your with your words and with your uh, scholarship and could you please just let's start with first with your autobiography could you just say a few words about yourself and your scholarship and your recent books including the one why the devil says to speak Latin that's that's what you got to mention please well I was uh, born in Brooklyn New York I grew up in the New York area I went to a uh, traditional classical school in Long Island called St. Paul's School in Garden City I went to a small American Liberal Arts Men's School called Haverford College. I got my PhD from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill in Classics, and I've worked in the way that Greek and Latin classics are transmitted in the, tra uh, the, the tradition of texts. And I also, as a parallel, got interested in the wider issue of tradition, of how the great uh, ideas, forces, and movements of our civilization get handed down, which is a both an interesting and a difficult topic, and I've done work both on the tradition of specific texts like Euripides, Bacchae, and Sophocles, and Antigone, but also the wider question of tradition itself. I've translated work by by the Catholic philosopher Joseph Pieper. I've uh, been working on the great Italian traditionalist Julius Avila, and I did my own book a few years ago called The Devil Knows Latin, Why America Needs the Classical Tradition. It's mm -hmm. now in its third edition, which I attribute to the title and the very nice cover. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And which edition? Wh 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 who was it published by? Published by ISI Books in Wilmington, Delaware. Chris, if you don't mind, on a technical level, I notice you don't have a website. I see your pieces everywhere, and your books uh, are, are posted everywhere, but I don't see how come you don't have a website, because I certainly would like to, to, to plug your book, and I would like to introduce you, to my, my listeners, to, to, your, to your immense scholarly work. Well, that's you make it, making a very good point. I will say that uh, there is a description of me on the web page of the Honors Program of the University of Colorado, and also the Center for Western Civilization at the University of Colorado does have a web page, but it's true that I don't, and you're right that I need one. Please do that, and I noticed also you got pieces on the alternative, alternative right uh, uh, website by my friend uh, Mr. Spencer, and I also read some of your pieces there. Yes, that's absolutely true. That's one place you can find my uh, my stuff. And if you search for me through Google, along with the denunciations, there are a few other things by me as well. Believe it or not, you were recently right, Chris. Tell us something. You were in, you were a couple of well, you spent quite some time, substantial time in in, in Italy, didn't you? It was a long time. Yes. Ago. Well, my 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 pedantic work is on uh, the manuscripts of Greek tragedy and on other ancient works as well, including ancient. Uh, commentaries and, and ancient scholarship, and uh, I was lucky enough to get uh, springs in both 2005 and 2008 in Rome, uh, where I was doing research on a number of topics. I, I work with the University of Urbino, which has a wonderful classics department, the last private university in Italy, and uh, I, and the American Academy itself is is a private uh, institution, and um, I've been able to be very lucky both to get to know a lot of wonderful Italians, to work on manuscripts in Italy, and to get to know Italian culture, which is an extremely lively, vital, and dynamic one, and one where where the right wing and conservatism is very healthy and alive. Mm -hmm. When was that exactly? Just for our audience, we need to specify that. When, when, when were you in Italy? The last two times was 2005 and 2008. I was there for the last election when the right uh -huh. won, much to the surprise of all my academic friends who were convinced that the so-called Democratic Party, which in fact is the Communist Party, mm -hmm. uh, was going to win. And um, on the contrary, the right won an outstanding victory. 
And, uh, you know, there are a number of European countries in trouble now, the so-called PIGS, the P-I-G-S uh, yes. countries there. And I always say the reason why I stands for Ireland and not Italy is because uh, the right won that election a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I'm asking you that, I'm sure you noticed the tremendous change since the 60s, that even nowadays, <coughs> excuse me, in Italy and all over Europe, the classics that, you know, it was an obligatory obligatory subject for me, believe it or not, even in communist Yugoslavia, where I grew up in the early 60s, so when we had to study Greek and Latin, you know, and all those classic authors. But now, as I'm sure you're aware of this uh, widespreading disease, it's no longer just the United States, but it's all over Europe. You would very little. I'm sure last time when you were in, 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 in Italy, I'm sure you, you have... Uh, you encounter less and less experts on, on the classical uh, literature, classes, so to speak, than, let's say, 20 years ago. Well, I will say this. The, the bright young people I meet are mainly working in schools, and they're mm -hmm. a little bit discouraged that there are fewer university positions than there used to be, uh, and there aren't all that many. The University of Rome has a wonderful Greek department. The University of Urbino has a great classics department, but it is discouraging. On the other hand, Italy is a country you can still walk into almost any bookstore and see books uh, with uh, in paperback with Greek or Latin on one side of the page and Italian translation on the other. So yeah. there clearly are still a lot of Italians who who buy translations and who you know, with, with, with the original text there. In America, a lot of people still buy translations. But in Italy, having the Greek or Latin on one side and the Italian on the other is very common. And there are multiple um, editions of important texts like Euripides Bacchae. Mm -hmm. So I, certainly it's discouraging to see less of that. And people who are getting into classics as a profession are discouraged because there are not as many university positions as there used so. to be. So, quote unquote, they still know their classics. Well, yes, I guess in a mandatory fashion. I know it firsthand in, in Croatia, which is just next door. No, Latin is no longer needed. Greek is no longer needed. Everybody really? is into this vocational, professional crap. Everybody wants to cut the quick, quick money, and that's it. But just, just one thing before we come to, to our, our author Julius Sevola, you also wrote about the Bible. So let's try, let's start with that a little bit, just for the, for the sake of fun. You also wrote about the Bible, and I'm sure you, you, you are, you're also an expert on Christianity, and you wrote uh, some pieces on, on, on monotheism and Christianity. Could you tell us something about that work? Well, um, I, I do regularly teach the Bible. I was lucky enough that uh, I was taught Greek. I, I learned uh, Hebrew when I was in graduate school, so I can so I can teach the Hebrew Bible. I wouldn't teach it unless I could read it. And uh, America as a country with the Bible is still very much alive and important. I teach a lot of ancient subjects, and I have to persuade the students that they're still relevant to today's world. But in the case of the Bible, you don't have to persuade people that in America. Americans oh, know, know the Bible is relevant. Now, some people think that's a bad idea. Some think mm. it's a good idea. But um, mm. it, it, w one reason why America is a lot healthier than people think is Americans are still profoundly traditionalist. They mm. care about their constitution which is 200 years old. They read the Bible, which is over 2,000 years old. Very and good that's point. amazing. I'm very glad that you brought this up, especially for my listeners here in Europe, that ironically, or rather should I say paradoxically, the United States of America in some fashions turns out to be much more traditionalist than, the, than, than Europe with its republic, uh, with its, uh, concern, uh, what do you call it, Jacobin Revolution, the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, especially in the South. Now, one thing, and here we're going to start now. How do you square after all this giant, Julius Sevola, now let's face it, he was an anti-Christian, he was a quote-unquote pagan, he was a polytheist in a sense, mindset, he's a man of staggering erudition, and how do you square away with this, uh, with your teaching, if I may ask you, of the Bible? Well, uh, I think that his insights into tradition, and the centrality of tradition, and the content of the tradition uh, is extremely important as he's one of the great expounders of the of the integral character and universal and global character of tradition in human life and i find him extremely impressive there he also had very strong political uh, and religious views and like someone else i also admire uh, niccolo machiavelli he thought that the catholic church in italy was although it was superficially conservative and although it had great roots as a tradition, and had been very traditional during the during the Middle Ages, he felt that it was going to go in a universalist direction.
direction. He felt that people like Jacques Maritain in, in, in mm. France, and he knew French and German culture very, very well, that that was the future of the Catholic Church. And it amazes me that he could, in, in 1927, write a book like Pagan Imperialism, warning Mussolini against uh, signing the Concordat with the Catholic Church because the long term effects of the Catholic Church were going to be universalist and be against mm. the great traditions because uh, Pius XI was a very great traditionalist. He really was. He's probably the greatest pope since, since Pius IX. But let's face it, Abela turned out to be right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad, and we have to re-emphasize it once again, Chris. So, in other words, he had this ugly premonition of Vatican II, rather, and this liberalization or quote-unquote communization of the Catholic Church in this mid-60s, uh, which, in fact, we, we happen to be the offsprings of that uh, Vaticanization, of this uh, secularization of the Catholic Church. So, in other words, Julius Evola had this premonition back in the 20s and 30s, right? Yes, he saw it very clearly, he expounded it very clearly, he later um, expressed regret for how vigorously he wrote in Pagan Imperialism, but the fact is, it's a beautifully written book, it's a fantastically, dynamically, it, it is a young man's book, it's not a mature older person's book, but uh, I read it expecting to be outraged by, by one silly statement after another, and on the contrary, it's a powerful, dynamic book arguing for the great traditions of Italy over against what he felt were perversions of those traditions. Okay, let me just clear. Uh, Chris, is this book available in English or did you read it in, 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 in Italian? I read it in Italian. It is not available for many of the major people because most of um, Avalu's stuff has been published by, 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 by mainstream uh, New Age presses in America. And Pagan yeah. Imperialism isn't available that way, but there may be a translation of it Somewhere. Because oh. a number of his things have also been translated by smaller presses. Okay, well, what and, was that? And, oh, and Pagan Imperialism, however, is, is available by a mainstream publisher in Italy. Mm -hmm. Now this this uh, okay uh, this this piece on on the on the on the, on the, on the quote unquote the secularization of the Catholic dogma. How, what was the you read it in the original? What was the name in the original? And what's it's the It's called it's, 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 it's called Imperialismo Pagano. It's called Pagan Imperialism. Imperialismo Pagano. Pagan. Okay, okay, okay. So I know it's available in English then. So it is. Okay, for, okay. For the sake of our community, because I, I know some folks you know have very good websites on on Ulu Sevala. This guy Thompson. Uh, Kyle Thompson uh, is a friend of mine. He has uh, quite a few of things posted in English, uh, in English and in French on Julius Sevola. And unfortunately, you wouldn't believe it, despite the fact that my mom is of Italian origin. I never bothered to learn the, the Italian language, but uh, my, my, my French is quite fluent. So, in fact, I, I read... Uh, Almost every major work by Avola is available in French. Yes, uh, yes. It's, they've really done a terrific job in translating him. Translating him into English has, is, is just in its earlier stages now. Uh -huh. Okay, um, uh, Chris. Yeah, I'm go ahead. So, you know, I'm so pleased to have you here, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to have another show next week uh, on on uh, on Julius Sevilla and his uh, uh, concept of the political. But let's just try to clarify some concepts for our younger audience. What would you suggest yourself personally, from your from your perspective, from your background? What would you suggest for somebody for initiation into Evola, if we can use the Evolian thinking? What would you suggest to an American reader as a first book to start with? Well, it's a great question, and uh, his classic central book that explains his ideas in context is called Revolt Against the Modern World. Sure, and it's, exactly. it's, it's a fantastic book. It does have a good introduction by, by the Austrian esotericist Hansen, which is a nice introduction to it. And it is, it is very clear and it is very systematic. Mm -hmm. um, there also um, are some other texts of which Men Among the Ruins is a is a very good example, which again is very clear, and which is much more specifically political. So people with political interest might be interested in starting there. Let me start um, with the first one. Can you give us just a short synopsis of the first one for our younger <laughs> students? What um, the the title itself picks up in a book by the by. The, by the French esotericist René Guénon called Crisis yes. of the Modern World, Crisis du Monde Moderne. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and yes. there it's, you know, the modern situation. Abel picks up on this because it isn't enough to endure it. You need to oppose it. And so he wrote Revolta contra el mundo moderno, Revolt against the modern world. He explains what traditionalism is. He explains what a complete human being is, not just an animal, but body, a soul and spirit. He explains what a traditional civilization is, which is one where, again, these differences in human beings are, are explicitly recognized, and people have a place in which there's the role for the sacred, a role for the warrior, a role for the merchant, and a role for, for other people. Uh, he, he talks about uh, how fulfilling that kind of society is, and then how the step-by-step -step degeneration took place whereby each of the, the cast, instead of uh, performing their own proper function, try to take over. And now we've reached the lowest stage of all, which is the stage where the merchants have taken over. Mm -hmm. where, and not even merchants anymore, because it isn't even people who make things and sell them, it's people on Wall Street who speculate on other people. Mm -hmm. So we've really reached it, and he argues strongly that the vision of the four ages, which we find in the Greeks, we find in the Bible, we find in, in the Hindu, Hindu tradition, the movement from gold, silver, bronze, and iron. We are now in the Iron Age, what the Hindus called the Dark Ages. And what we view as being the wonderfulness of our age, all the mechanical things, all the emphasis on money, all the evaluation of things, by, by what you can get for paper money, and the... the uh, the um, the uh, prestige given to people who merely speculate and don't create and can't fight and can't pray that this is the sign of a of a dark age, but the dark age will be followed by a new golden age. So the fact that we're in a dark age in one sense is depressing. On the other hand, it means that we are the closest to the coming again of the golden age. And and for Abel, we need to fight for this. We can't just wait for it to happen. We need to stand up and help restore a true golden age in which human beings can be recognized as, as, as complete and which society will be structured in a way that will make it healthy and vital and fulfilling for human beings and truly creative. Excellent, Chris. I'm so pleased indeed that you have made mention this. And uh, look, I'm sure those people who speculate and all those folks who embezzle money in different Ponzi schemes, I'm sure they have a, diff a specific name. <laughs> and Julio Sevala wrote quite specifically about those people who who actually represent, who are basically the archetype, or so archetype, so to speak, of this dark age. And we know who those people are. So, what exactly can you can you can you tell us something about those uh, specific species, and of course, us who mimic us, <laughs> who mimic them rather in in such a fashion? Well, the, the, the problem is that uh, these people are both have a misunderstanding of what it is to be a human being. They emphasize enormously the animal part, the physical part, at the expense of, of, of soul and spirit, and they also undermine the real role of the spiritual and the, war, the, and the warrior, the priest and the warrior. And a healthy society is run by priests and warriors, and the people who supply have, have a rule, and, and they, they have a place too, but they don't run things. Instead, we used to have a situation Situation, and this was the old bourgeoisie in the 19th century, when these people who made things and, 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 uh, and, and traded them um, were, were, were running things. But now we've gotten to an even worse stage where it's purely speculators. It used to be these speculators are about 2% of our economy. They're almost a quarter of the U.S. economy now are people who make nothing, grow nothing. They're not even good examples of the merchant class. They just speculate on money. And they undermine religion. They hate religion. They undermine uh, warriors. They, they hate warriors. Of course, what they hate more than anything else is a trade war, which for them is the ultimate blasphemy. Um, and, of course, they hate the idea that, that families and communities and states would actually value themselves as hierarchical wholes as against everyone being equal to buy and to sell. And the consumer becomes the ideal and no longer uh, the priest or the warrior. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Chris, uh, Dr. Kopf, should I say, <laughs> Chris, but you understand that those speculators, we've had this matter of affair and everything, they have a name, which brings us, of course, to this Jewish question. And there's an interesting point about... Uh, uh, about Julius Sevola. He was quote-unquote an anti-Semite, quote-unquote, but at the same time he was viciously opposed to anti-Semitism. So I think that this needs to also be clarified for our, for our, for our listeners. Could you, could you give us a, your, your view on it? 
Well, he did not think that the, um, he believed that just as there are races of body, there are races of soul and, and of mm. spirit, but, but he uh, understood that there were many uh, people in the Jewish tradition, and the Orthodox tradition especially, who had committed their lives to, to the spirit, who were part of a long tradition that had been handed down, and it wasn't like the physical traits of brown eyes or, or um, you know, uh, male pattern baldness or all these purely physical things that get handed down inevitably. Uh, he certainly saw that there was some very bad influence in our society that come from giving too great power to the speculators. But he understood that this was not a uh, inevitable thing and that we should concentrate on opposing speculation, not concentrate on one of the groups that does it. Mm -hmm. Well, we should also acknowledge factually that, you know, the sure. does form a very large percentage, an but overly it, large percentage. Well, uh, but regardless of that, we're not going to harp too much on it, but nonetheless, he talks about the Jewish spirit, the rather mens, the me mental set, which has nothing to do with this racial Jewishness. He never actually focuses on that. And the fact of the matter is, even when he discusses this uh, elders of Zion, he says, well, he just flatly says, it doesn't really matter whether this is correct or not, but the fact of the matter is that the substance, the incipient substance in the elders of Zion is more or less true. It's correct. Yes, that's right. He, he, he acknowledged that the, that the protocols may have been invented by, by, by someone who was opposed to it, describing it. But he also said you have to understand that it's a very cute analysis. Mm -hmm. And a number of the factors in it, for the example, finding and encouraging morally corrupt people to rise to the head of a society. And that's something which is which is there in the in the protocols, and we see it again and again. These very corrupt people uh, rising to high to high positions, people who couldn't have made it there two hundred years ago, they wouldn't have mm -hmm. been considered as plausible people because it undermines the society when the people that lead it are themselves morally corrupt. And this is a profound mm -hmm. insight, no matter where it came from. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, there are so many issues to discuss uh, uh, about. And uh, Chris, if you don't mind, we'll just keep it a little bit low level because if we start with uh, some arcane and two academic words, I'm sure we'll <laughs> our audience, our younger audience, may feel a little bit scared because this is really a very heavy, heavy duty author. It's very uh, uh, difficult to understand, especially some of uh, some of his uh, metaphysical uh, uh, point, uh, views. We will continue in another segment then afterwards, when we take a break afterwards. Let me first explain for our listeners, uh, how does uh, uh, um, Evola views the masses? Of course, you already said in your, in your previous statement that he, he's aware of the fact that we live in a total sort of a commercialized, hedonistic society, and actually had a very lousy opinion about the masses. Could you just tell us in your words, in Evolian words, what is the, the, the main theme uh, uh, about the masses as far as the Evola is concerned? Well, society is naturally hierarchical. Uh, the majority of people are not leaders. They're, they're, they're neither religious, nor political, nor, nor, nor military, nor even economic leaders. Uh, there is a role for them, but it can never, you can never have a political system modeled on, on the masses because they are by their nature not creative, they are not leaders, they follow. And the role of, of uh, their, their position is to feel the right charismatic group to follow. And the terrible thing is when they're so corrupted that they follow the bourgeoisie, that they follow traders and, and, and merchants and, and, um, and, and speculators. But uh, in order to change things, we don't need a mass movement. We need well-trained leaders. And uh, once those well-trained leaders are, are educated and initiated and ready, the masses will follow. The masses will follow, but the idea of concentrating on the masses or rejoicing because the masses, you know, agree with us on this issue or that, it will have viewed as quite foolish because they agree with all kinds of silly things. They mm. can't be the basis of any progress, and in fact, the extent to which they are allowed to determine things, we sink lower and lower in the dark age. Well, I'm sure, uh, Chris, uh, you will uh, you will agree with that masses are asses. And folks, just before we take a break, let me just again say that I'm extremely happy and very honored to have uh, such a distinguished guest on my show. 
Christian Kopf is a famous uh, classicist, famous author, translator, and a man of real staggering erudition. And again, folks, and again and again, please do open up the Google and type his name and uh, read some of his books. It's one thing when you listen to Dr. Kopf, but it's entirely different when you read his excellent prose. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, this is Tom Sunik, your host. And uh, folks, I have a distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Christian Kopf. Uh, Chris, uh, welcome back. Uh, Take we it just, back. Oh, thank you, Chris. It's really a great pleasure for me because uh, you certainly know the expression Fachidiot. That's what the Germans say is somebody who is involved with expertise. And uh, unfortunately, our education has become so uh, departmentalized or compartmentalized to the extent that folks have forgotten completely about our, our classic uh, our, our heritage. So I certainly would like you to, to comment on that real briefly before we return to Julius Sevola. Well, it's it's part of the degeneration of our age that the great liberal arts education that was meant to introduce people to the tradition and to prepare them both for the arts of language and the arts of math, now we've determined to make everybody have some technical career. We overemphasize the arts of mathematics over the arts of language, and uh, we've lost, we're all experts in something, but nobody is, has a real vision of the whole of our society and of the great traditions, which are essential for the survival of our society. That's a very good point, which brings me to the second topic that you need to clarify, and which uh, Julius Sevola uses quite often, the elite. Look at this, for instance, Chris. We have today the elites, but these are not of so sort of elites. These are Hollywood elites. These are not true spiritual elites. Could you please clarify this very important issue? How does uh, Julius Sevola conceive of the true elite? Well, the question of uh, of leadership is essential both as a political and as a really moral uh, uh, question. And the, and the issue was one that fascinated people in the early 20th century as a whole. There was a lot of important research in um, in Italy and elsewhere on it. And uh, unfortunately, there was an increasing concentration on treating leaders as people who were successful in a financial sense. And this was typical of a degenerate age. Abel insisted that a real elite are, are people who understand what a complete human being is, that, that, that spirit and, and soul are more important than body, that, that leadership, religious and, and military, is more important than making a lot of money, and that their commitment is to the life of their society as transmitted down from the very beginning of humanity in the great traditions. And that... You have to be both educated to get this, you have to know about these difficult traditions, and you need to be initiated into the moral and religious life that leadership takes. And it isn't just having uh, the idea of a better mousetrap or a more efficient computer program doesn't make you a leader. What makes you a leader okay. is you're well-educated and then you're initiated into the life of a leader. Good point, Chris. Just for a second, I'm going to interrupt you. How do you initiate, let's say, how I'm going to initiate my young listeners into true leadership, into true elitism? Well, the hardest part, education can partly be done by people reading the right books and learning foreign languages and reading uh, interesting, important works. But at some stage, initiation means contact with those who are initiated and going through this process of... of um, uh, uh, asceticism, of self-control, of learning how to not only value your spirit and soul ahead of your body, but how to make your body the servant of your spirit and soul. And that's something that, that you, you can't sort of summarize it. It takes a small group of people themselves under uh, the leadership of a member of the elite to introduce them into this situation and it's getting increasingly hard to find the right people to do that. Well, does he make he does certainly make some suggestions as to who will sponsor those future elites. And what does he say, Julius Sevela? Could you explain it a little bit further, please? Well, there are people, there are still surviving traditions that still manage to have the, the role of initiation as part of what they do. In fact, all the great professions, there is some initiatory character. It's most especially found in, in, in the great religions. And that's true of the religions of the East, 
though there still are aspects of it that survive in the West. Mm-hmm. And the and and this is where both he and, and Gaynor felt it was important to get in touch with the great Eastern uh, traditions, where 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 the active practice of initiation was still part of the religious and social life of their societies. Let me that's what I understand. That, uh, where, uh, one thing where I'm puzzled with you, to say, well, again, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, we don't want to get too arcane and too self-serving. But uh, you will say talks very much about yoga. In other words, he's sort of a transplanting this oriental, literally, not just in a pejorative sense, but in a literal sense, oriental thought into Italy, into into Europe. And, and I, for some reasons, I would have expected him to be a little bit more ingrained, uh, entrenched into all the pagan, uh, well, as he was, by and large, he, uh, into all pre-Christian uh, heritage. What prompted him, probably know a little bit more about that, what prompted him in the first place to become so uh, enamored with this uh, yoga teaching? Well, he was afraid that the, the the Western versions of initiation had been corrupted. He was something where, where he disagreed from René Guénon, who was still convinced that the West still preserved um, traditions of, of, of initiation that could be used and revived and, 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 and brought back to direct contact. Abel was more convinced that these traditions had been too corrupted in the West to be useful. This way to go back to the earliest Buddhist tradition. He didn't care much for contemporary Buddhism, but he admired early Buddhism. His first translated work into English was the Doctrine of Awakening, which is about early Buddhism. He also was very impressed with yoga. He was impressed with the Zen tradition. He was very impressed with the samurai tradition. Um, and he felt that these living traditions in the East needed to be um, brought to the attention of the West because ultimately they all went back to the same central tradition that was at the origin of, of human humanity as a whole. And that in our time, although the West was very proud about the fact that we had tanks and we had a complicated financial system, we had a lot of factories, we had lost touch with how to make our uh, how to make our bodies subservient to our minds and souls, and that these traditions survive best in the traditions of the samurai, Zen, uh, yoga, and certain aspects, other aspects of the Hindu traditions. Mm-hmm. Let me just uh, exactly. You know, I must say, uh, I'm, as much as I've read Yulu Sevala, there are certain things that have really puzzled me and, and, and which I stumbled over. Like, I, he was for sure a very good European. There is no question about that. He was uh, proud of his racial and his uh, cultural heritage. But at, at the same time, well, like, take, for instance, Genon. Genon even converted to Islam. And this is something which with some of our listeners may not talk about to start with. And how do you explain this, this uh, quote-unquote, uh, those... Uh, uh, baits, or how can I put it better? Those siren sounds from the Orient, from the from Asia, coming over and 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 uh, sort of uh, uh, becoming part and parcel of his teaching. Well, ultimately, integral traditionalism thinks that there was a single tradition at the very beginning in the true golden age, and that as the different parts of humanity developed and in the modern terms they evolved and got better in progress but in the traditionalist point of view they devolved and became worse that different parts of the tradition survived in in different forms in these different groups and mm-hmm. so there were um, well, one of the things I do when I try to edit a text is that we don't have, because I'm dealing with ancient authors, we don't have the author's own copy, so you try and find different manuscripts, none of which preserve the work perfectly, but when you bring them together, you can then find different parts are corrupted and different parts are preserved. And that is what Gaynon and Avila found in the East. Certain things that have been lost in the in the West, the consciousness of caste, the um, understanding that spirit and, and soul are superior to body and must rule it, which we certainly find in the Western tradition, which we find Plato talking about, which we find St. Benedict absolutely. talking about. But, and I'm they, sure. but they survived yeah. as living you know, institutions in the East, and that's where they felt that we had things to learn from the East. Mm, excellent. Well, uh, folks, uh, I have a uh, doctor... 
uh, Christian Kopf here is a man of a stunning erudition. Uh, certainly would suggest you to, to read some of his books and some of his translation. I certainly would, uh, would also urge you folks to, to read Julius Seville, a very complicated author, but some of his books have been very well translated into English language. And I'm sure Chris wouldn't mind if you get an email from some of our fans, from some of our listeners, and if you could pass, possibly specifically uh, specifically give them some answers on some specific questions that, may, that they may have. Yes, I'd love to. To the extent okay. that I can. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, uh, Chris, let me just move on because he introduces so many concepts, uh, uh, Julius Seville. And just before we come to this uh, brief on uh, on his political views and how he was demonized after the war, uh, let me just uh, say, uh, uh, say a few words about his concept of masculinity. The reason I'm asking that, you know, I'm a linguist myself, just like you, and those words have been t totally today demonized and taken out of context. Like when you talk about masculinity, folks have an impression that he wrote a, a sex manual or something. He did write about sex very much at the dental level. Could you please explain very briefly, but in a very simple lingo, what he meant by masculinity? masculinity and what he actually meant by the metaphysics of sex, if I can put it that way. Well, um, again, the, the complete human being is, is, uh, is, is body, soul, and spirit. Everyone understands that, that uh, there are differences between the sexes on the physical level, um, even though some people would want to deny them. What Abel insists is that these are profound ways of being. Male and female are profound ways of being, and that they are just as important. They are, in fact, more important on the level of, of soul and spirit and that the uh, role of masculinity is even more important in the life of a society wh where, where it is a spiritual and a, and a psychic reality, and that both male and female are needed, and that the modern world tends to try and bring them together, to ignore the differences. Now, they have a tough time ignoring the physical differences, which usually they privilege. In this case, they're very embarrassed by them, because they want to reduce male and female to one level, just as they want to reduce the, the castes to one level, and, mm -hmm. and undermine the role of priest and, and military leader, and emphasize, at first, the role of the merchant, and finally, of course, the role of the mass, the mass person. And this is something where understanding that to be a man is a mission. It's not just an accident. It is your mission, and you need to take that very seriously. And that's one place where Avila differed from Guénon very strongly. He felt that part of being a man was being a leader, was, was actively being involved in your society as a leader, whatever society you were born into. Whereas Guénon played very little role in French politics, and after his, his first wife died, he literally moved to Egypt and, <laughs> and became a sheik. Yeah, and, I, I, you know, this is, for Evola, this is impossible. He's born an Italian. There's a great Roman tradition. He, need, as a man, he has a mission to live that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Excellent point indeed, folks. I'm sure you enjoyed this show. Uh, let me ask you, Chris, uh, uh, well, we know what happened after the second world war. We know, I don't know how many of our listeners know, and you should probably give them a short uh, introduction into um, how he was actually uh, crippled after the second war due to this uh, air, air raid by the Allies. So he lived in Vienna the, the, last, uh, the last months of the, of the war. So could you just give us a, a story of in a few minutes of, as to what what happened to him in the last years of the war. In fact, after that, uh, Italy surrendered in 1943, and what was his fate, or what was his plight, rather, after the Second World War? Um, yeah, uh, Abel had fought in, in World War One. In, in World War Two, he was older, he did, he did research, and he was doing research in Vienna on the, uh, on the uh, initiatory uh, traditions of the West when he was crippled in, a, in an air raid. And um, as the, although he loved mountain climbing and loved being an active physical man, he also felt the body was inferior to soul and spirit and continued to write. Uh, and at one stage, uh, the, the Italian government put him on trial for uh, trying to revive the, um, the uh, fascist party and for this is after the Second World War, right? After the Second World War. After the Second World War. Uh, because yeah. the, Ita the Italian government, when it took over, ultimately was a liberal Catholic government, exactly as he had predicted might happen. And they outlawed the fascist party. It didn't do much good because they just 
changed the name to the Italian Social Movement. Um, mm -hmm. And Abel himself saw himself as a kind of guru who was trying to explain a vision of the world to young people. And for this, he was put on trial. He took no part in politics. He wasn't. He was never a a card carrying fascist. But he was put on trial, and he gave a great defense, which has been translated as part of the volume of Men Among the Ruins, mm -hmm. uh, and is available separately in Italian if you get the get the Roman and, and buy it. Wonderful defense, clearly modeled on Socrates' apology. And when Socrates defended himself against the Athenian democracy, Abel defended himself against the Italian democracy and didn't back down on anything. But he did make the point that his commitments were to the great Western traditions, not to any political party. And uh, he was a good deal more successful than Socrates. Socrates was condemned to death. Abel was found innocent, which under Italian law, you, which is Roman law, you can be found innocent, not guilty or guilty. Anglo-Saxon law, it's only not guilty or guilty. He was found innocent of the charges because what he was trying to do was save the West, not mm -hmm. reconstitute a political party. And that was absolutely mm -hmm. correct. Well, uh, let me ask you, these are now haunting questions. How his virtual, a virtual own, even in Italy, and in the student curriculum, you don't come, you don't come across his name. Everybody talks about, um, uh, PC authors, uh, you know, what comes to my mind is uh, Umberto Eco and what have you, but <laughs> very few people have heard of, of you with Sable in Italy. How do you say that? We, we know the answer, but I'd say, I'm sure you, our listeners would like to know you. Um, well, I will say this. Um, major New Age presses in both Italy and America keep Avila's works in print. There have been new editions of most of his works, uh, by the Edizioni Mediterranei in Italy. Uh, New Traditions in America has his major works in print. Uh, in French, almost everything is in print. In German, yes. most things mm. are in print. It's true that the, the mainstream media does not talk about him. He is never mentioned on Fox News. You and I are amazed at this, but it's true. However, his books are available. I mean, people are reading him. Um, you know, the, the presses that keep him in... If you go into a major bookstore in Rome, you can ask for his books, and they can get them out of a major press. If you get on Amazon.com and print his name in, uh, E-V-O-L-A, you'll get a list of ten books or so that are kept in print and at a very good price. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, right now, his autobiography... Uh, Cinnabar Path has just been translated into English, and that is out of print now in Italy. So it's easier to get in English than in Italian. Mm -hmm. So this is a person who's not talked about by the mainstream media, but his books are in print. When I go around and talk about him uh, at, at the last um, uh, Mencken Club meeting, uh, there were people who'd flown in from all over America because they heard there was going to be a talk about Julius Avila. And this I'm is something that... It. It, it's fascinating because in one sense, as you say, the mainstream media never discusses him. The New York Times never mentions him. No, no serious person mentions him. And yet, his books are in print and people are excited about him. And mm -hmm. they should be. Well, it's not just the media. I hate to say that, but you know, you, the, he's not in a syllabus either. You, you, you don't find him. I'm sure even in your, at your school or at universities, you, you don't come across his name in, in any He's not taught? No. He's not taught. That's absolutely right. He's not taught. Again, again, we have this guilt by association because she was born at the wrong time at the, at the, right, at the wrong place as well. And well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this, uh, but uh, let's just try for a while to put things in a wider context. You know what happened in France. You know what happened, you know, in, in Germany. Ten times, well, five times worse than in Italy. The ten, many Italian scholars, uh, well, Gentile, of course, he was killed by partisan in '44. But the, many Italian scholars, actually, they, they, they saved their lives because the laws, in, in, uh, as it was the case in, with Evola, were not as repressive uh, in Italy, in the post-war Italy, as they were in France and in, in, in Germany. Would you agree that, Chris? Yes, it's absolutely true. The, in fact, he was quite convinced that there was hopes for a revival in Italy. There was, um, I mean... As late as the 1970s, there was still a monarchist party in Italy. The Italian social movement survived all the way in, which was the direct heir of the fascist party, survived all the way into the 1990s when it changed its name uh, um, 
you know, to the National Front. There was just a a whole set of um, there, there have always been right wing newspapers. There have always been right wing press. I mean, Italy has a. It also, by the way, has a strong Communist Party and strong leftist traditions as well. But in, in Italy, uh, uh, there were far right wing professors. There's always been a real debate. The far right has always been part of the Italian Parliament. It's not like other countries where they've been marginalized so strongly. Uh, I'm glad to point that out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, now we're seeing in Italy, in, in Europe, this very strange thing where, where in many respects, as in demographically, Europe is in terrible trouble, but but the far right is stronger than ever in Europe. Mm -hmm. Especially in Italy, and I'm glad that you pointed this out. America has the First Amendment, and some of my friends, and I don't want to be too explicit what type of the topics they deal with, and when they have the lectures and when they stage those venues, they usually do it in Italy because it turns out that they can still uh, get away with certain things that you would never, ever say in Austria, in a neighboring Austria, for that matter, in Germany, let alone in France, which are which are quite um, uh, strict in terms of the thought police. So yes, indeed, Italy is much better. <laughs> Right, I'm sure you would well, agree. Well, one of the amazing things was when Avila wrote his polemics against uh, the government signing the concordat with the Catholic Church in the 1920s, um, although this was a fascist dictatorship, uh, no one stopped him from publishing these works, and indeed Mussolini had decided to sign the concordat. But he made mm -hmm. it plain that he had no intention of suppressing this debate, and there was a very lively debate uh, because of a sort that couldn't take place in, in most places in, in Europe, including the democracies. It's a fascinating uh, topic, and you know, he was a fascinating man. I, I don't, I don't know if you, or I'm sure you know that, but some of our listeners probably may not know that he was also versed in different drugs, in different hallucinogenic drugs. He took different drugs just to experience this different world, like Adam Stringer. His, uh, he actually he corresponded with Adam Stringer, and this is something. This, this is something we also need to cover in our speeches, in our lectures. Uh, could you say us a few words about how he actually died this glorious death? You know, actually he was a uh, you know, very Pagan death. Well, I don't know uh, the details there. He was he he, he had been crippled uh, in World War Two. He he survived until 1974. He continued to write and be very active, but um, you know eventually uh, his body I think collapsed under what was you know inevitable when your body is in that kind of trouble. And uh, he was not afraid of death. Uh, he. Due to his, his soul and his spirit was going on, but I don't know the details of his death. Although I was in Italy when he when he passed away. All right. Well, I, I, well, he went through this. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, well. He decided to be in incarcerated, not incarcerated, what's the English word, yeah, I'm looking for the right word. He had his body burned in the old uh, uh, pagan truth. Yes. And, and then he passed his, away. Okay. Yeah, and, and then he, it, his it, ashes were thrown out on the mountains. No, actually, the, the, uh, it was scattered right here in the Adriatic coast, right where I live, near Bali. Oh, wow, okay. You know, all, 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 all over the sea, you know, because part of Croatia was... was, was uh, Italy as well, you know, the, the Adriatic coast, you know, so it was in jurisdiction until 943, and that's so This was in, in fact the 724 when, when he passed away, correct? And I know for sure that his body, in fact, that his ashes were scattered in the Adriatic Sea, in a very, very glorious death in the sense. <laughs> because, you know, the great right wing playwright from France, Monte Allon, who wrote Lorraine Mort and these other things, when he passed away, which was also in the early 70s, he had his ashes scattered over the Roman Forum. Oh yes, yes, absolutely against the law, of course. But, but he <laughs> passed away in '72 uh, when I, I, I got to Rome the next year, and, and Montelon had again had had himself cremated, and his ashes were were scattered over the um, Roman Forum and at the temple that was known as as the Temple of Masculine Virtue, which is a square yeah. temple by the Tiber. Excellent. Well, this is so. This is the thing to do. You and I are going to have to arrange for this. <laughs> Well, we can arrange, you know what the Spaniards used to say, you know, when they fought against the communists and the republicans, viva la muerta, long live death, so you never know. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Chris, it's really enjoyable, I really enjoyed talking to you. Listen, let me just ask you, I'm extremely pleased to have you and honored, and let's have another show, if you don't mind, next week, and we'll talk about some political stuff uh, from, from Evola, if you don't mind. Terrific, that would be great. 
Okay, well, Chris, well, thank you very, very much. I'm indeed pleased. And, folks, thank you for your attention. This was uh, uh, Dr. Kopf, a uh, great erudite, a great scholar. And I certainly would encourage you over and over again, please do read his books. And bye for now, and see you next time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is again uh, your host, Tom Sonic, and welcome back. And again, I would like to reintroduce you to our friend, uh, a well-known scholar, Dr. Chris Kopf. Chris, hello. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I hope you are too. I am also doing very well. And in fact, we got lots of things to cover. And I hope uh, our listeners won't get bored with too arcane stuff. Last time we were discussing about um, our favorite scholar, at least my favorite, your favorite scholar, author, philosopher, thinker, militant, uh, Julius Evola. I don't know exactly the pronunciation in... Uh, no, you pronounce it well. <laughs> I know, it's in Italian, Julius Evola. Julius Evola, we can say. Also and Julius, sure. Julius. And I certainly would like you to um, make a short synopsis just in two or three minutes uh, of his um, uh, Welschnets, of his uh, cultural pessimism, if you can put it that way, of his reference to Kali Yuga, of the dark times we live in. And then uh, specifically afterwards, I'm going to ask you a few questions. We're going to cover some topic. I'm just holding this book in front of me, which was one of my favorite. Unfortunately, it's in French, Essai Politique, uh, Essai Political Essays, which actually covers um, um, his work, um, his short essays, short pieces published, published in Vita Italiana and translated very well by, I'll tell you exactly who, it's a French, German, uh, a French, uh, uh, anyway, I, I think Philippe Bayet. Yes, so basically, why don't we start first with a short synopsis of, uh, of um, Julius Evola, because he's such a popular figure, not just in Europe, but also among quote-unquote right-wingers, in uh, the United States of America among different nationalists and different brands of nationalism, nationalists. So I'd like you, in your words, if you can just summarize in a few minutes why, in fact, uh, Julius Evola needs to be read and why is he so important, specifically for the American public. Well, it's a great question. Uh, as you just pointed out, almost everything by Evola has been translated into French. There's an increasing body of work being translated into English. He represents a uh, absolute rejection of the modern vision that the world is inevitably getting better and better, and that the physical and technological successes of the modern world represent a high point for humanity. He believes that to be really human is to be in touch with the great tradition which fa founded the human race, and according to which human beings are not merely intelligent animals, they are, they are a combination of body, soul, and spirit that is complex and in the proper human being is differentiated, that is, the higher controls the lower. He also thinks that history is a history of cycles, and those cycles go in a degenerative form. Uh, he commonly uses in the, the Western tradition of, of the gold, silver, bronze, and iron age, but he also likes to talk about the um, Hindu vision, according to which the last of the ages is the Dark Ages, the Kali Yuga. And uh, he analyzes the modern world about which there's such enthusiasm, uh, along with uh, his uh, his mentor and, and uh, man he admired many respects, René Guénon in, in France, that all the things we admire most about it, its emphasis upon technology, upon matter, upon satisfying human beings, upon the consumer, as being the signs of a dark age. And that a true noble age is one in which the spiritual and the noble, in which priest and warrior are admired and have their correct place in society, and which people live for the highest, not for the satisfaction of the lowest. And mm. naturally, in our modern world, this represents an absolute repudiation of economism, of feminism, of materialism, of all the things that have made the modern world distinctive in the eyes of people in that world. Yes, we are going to specifically now look at some of those essays, and I'm sure you're familiar with those essays, because basically those essays also transpire in his major book, The Man Among the Ruins. And of course they are written in a somewhat more simplistic fashion, if I can put it that way, 
so they may be more accessible and more uh, digestible, if I can put it that way, for our American listeners. Well, let me, of course, you're, 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 you're familiar with this cliche that he's often referred to as Herbert Marcuse of the right, of the right. Right, in Italy that was very popular. And why is that? Could you tell our listeners why is he Herbert Marcuse of the right wing? And why well, uh, my understanding is uh, that uh, Marcuse, more or less, his role was to liberate young people from their commitment to conventional liberalism and to the boring bourgeois vision uh, that was supposed to be progress, it wasn't enough, and make them look for a, for a really radical left-wing solution. Well, um, Evola does exactly the opposite. Instead of trying to have some moderate um, bourgeois conservatism, and the big conservative magazine in Italy after World War II was called Il Borghese, the, the bourgeois, mm -hmm. he argued that, in fact, uh, that was the merchant class. They should not be the leaders, and that the real leaders should be the warriors and the priests, the people in touch mm -hmm. with what is highest in a human being, and to liberate the Italian right from its being owned by what are basically, um, you know, free trade liberals, and to get them in touch with the great traditions of the West, which were also the great traditions of the Roman Empire and of the Italian people. And so he was freeing his people from a moderate vision that was itself a dead end. Okay, let me just, I'm sorry, Chris, we just need to clarify some issues for our American listeners. Of course, Julio Sevola was, I mean, viciously critical of bourgeoisie, of what we call in the United States of America, you know, the capitalist class. Could you please define it a little bit? I've just, you know, we read a piece on, on uh, several pieces that he wrote on, on, on Borghese, and, and he was incredibly you know, critical. He was, oh, by the way, also very critical of the American way of life. And I would certainly appreciate if you could explain that in your words. Why was that the case? Because we want to explain, in fact, we want to clarify. The reason being, we want to clarify that there are quite a few of distinctions between the classical American conservative right wing and this right wing of, we want to call it neo-fascist or proto-fascist, whatever, represented by Julius Seville. I would certainly appreciate if you could be very specific about that. Well, one of the areas that Ebola felt that the, the Hindu tradition had a lot to teach us was in the area of castes, that there were different roles in society, and that there was a role for the spiritual and the priestly, the Brahmin class. There was a role for the warrior and the and the uh, um, the warrior, the the, the, the Kshatriya class, mm -hmm. and there is certainly they were the natural leaders. There, there, there was a merchant class because you need to get your stuff sold. You need to get the, 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 the things you need to continue your life, the sutras class. But these people were never leaders, were not meant to be leaders. Their way of life that concentrated on what was secondary and, and in many respects, low uh, made them unfit to provide true leadership for people. It took people away from what was high and noble and directed it on dissatisfying physical needs. So he was horrified at the idea of the bourgeoisie rising to a position of prominence because exactly what one might have expected took place. There was there were a lot more stuff, there were a lot more goods, there were a lot of invention of mechanical things, but there was no true spiritual and political leadership. And he put an economic above the political and above the spiritual is one of the signs of the Dark Ages. Okay, now, just a second. How would you explain that to an average uh, middle-class man from the gated community in the United States of America, let's say in Tucson? How would he read that? How would he tr um, understand what you're saying? Well, one of the things that um, I, I, would, I would try to say to it, look, People who have risen to, to success understand that you need leadership. That's a concept they do understand. The question is, what is the best kind of, uh, of leadership? And people that can manipulate certainly have a function in the world, but ultimately the truly great leaders are people with a vision, with principles, with high ideals. They are aristocrats in the true sense of the term. It is the rule of the best. And uh, this was, and we everybody notices that when the United States was founded, we had a true aristocracy. These people owned land, they could read foreign languages, they had a vision of their country in the light of, 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 of centuries and millennia. They had a vision which made them great leaders and makes their writings still worth reading today. And nowadays, we have people who just lead us into one dead end after another. 
because mm-hmm. they have a very short-term vision. They're thinking about one quarterly report to another, one annual report to the stockholders to another, and never have a kind of wider vision of where our country should be going. And it's like walking into the woods, staring right in front of you. You're going to be bumping into trees and walking through poison ivy because you're not looking mm-hmm. ahead to get a wider vision of where you're going. So mm-hmm. that's one way to get across to, 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 to successful Americans. They understand we need leadership. They don't understand the kind of leadership we need. Exactly. So basically what you're suggesting to our listeners is they have to grasp the, the, uh, an, uh, another set of values, the true values, not those economistic, not those consumer society values, not instant gratification, because this is exactly what the Julius Sevola was, was propagating. He was against materialism and he was against this, con- what we now call consumerism in the West and in the United States of America specifically. Yes, and he thought it was a disastrous decision because although it satisfied temporary needs, it took you away from what was really important. The, the role of the economy is to serve the, uh, the, the, the nation and to serve the leaders, of the, the aristocracy. It's mm-hmm. to serve the spiritual and the political. And the, the economy should never be put ahead mm-hmm. of, the, of the welfare of the great uh, uh, leadership and, and or the head of the nation as a whole. You know, Chris, the reason I'm so picky about the etymology of those words is very simple. Uh, Our listeners, especially in the United States of America, need to realize that the true right-wingers in Europe include, well, I even hate this word right-wingers, but true nationalists, if you wish, true traditionalists, including Julius Evola, were not just critically uh, uh, we're not just critical of communism or Bolshevism. That, you know, the word Bolshevism was much more popular in the 20s and the 30s in Italy and German. But they were highly critical of capitalism as well. And America was just the very opposite of of, uh, of what uh, uh, Julius Sevalov, for that matter, Spengler and other conservative revolutionaries of that time espoused. Yes, that's absolutely true. Avila is very clear in places like the introduction to uh, Men Among the Ruins that there is no fundamental principle difference between Bolshevism and, and free trade capitalism. That they are both reductionist systems that value the economy ahead of the spiritual and the, and, 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 and the and leadership. That mm. they, it's true that their way of using the economy is different. But ultimately, they view the economy, the, the famous slogan of President Clinton's campaign manager was, it's the economy, stupid. The mm. economy is everything. If you win on the economy, you've won. And the whole vision of wider leadership is absolutely gone, and capitalists uh, are just as bad in this regard as communists. And in fact, often notice, you hear this all the time, from the libertarians in America, from the people on the Fox Business Network in America. Why won't the conservatives give up on their silly ideas? As long as we're free economically, then we're truly free. Mm-hmm. And that is what Avila found an abomination, what I think, frankly, most American conservatives find as an abomination, that the economy is the mark of success instead of being a means to mm-hmm. a fulfilled human life and a fulfilled society. Yes, well, this is something... And we need to stress and underline to our listeners, because I sometimes also have problems and troubles on a purely semantic level explaining to my friends and my students in the States that capitalism, uh, or free trade as we call it in a more euphemistic fashion, has a rather <coughs> negative connotation among uh, quote-unquote nationalists and the right-wing uh, wingers or the new right in, in, uh, in Europe. By the way, folks, again, I'd like to, to alert you. This is a Dr. Uh, Chris Kopp, a good friend of mine, a man of really staggering erudition. I'd suggest to you to look up his name on the Google, and, of course, I'd suggest to you to, to read some of his books and some of his stuff. And, of course, he's a top-notch expert on Julius Sevola, and I would suggest to you to read some of his pieces and some of his books or contact the VOR, contact uh, me, or for that matter, you can write directly to Christian, to Dr. Kopf. Uh, Chris, just, I'm, just, uh, I'm just looking at this translation. I'm sure you're familiar with this brief essay. You can tell me if this essay was translated into English, Processo à la Borghesia, and the French translated it Procès de la Bourgeoisie, which means the process and the indictment, rather, of the bourgeoisie, which is one of my favorite against capitalism. <laughs> Are you familiar with this essay? I'm I don't know that particular one, but it's completely consistent with it's his anti-bourgeois yeah. position. 
Yeah, he published that in 1940. Of course, we know what type of a regime was right. there. In fact, he met once with Mussolini. We, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't obfuscate. We shouldn't uh, hide that. In fact, he was very popular among quote unquote fascist circles, intellectual high intellectual circles in 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 Italy. Despite the fact that he was never a member of the party, he was never interested. a member of the party. He was not a card carrying fascist. But we know that Mussolini admired him. Yeah, he, there is no question. There is this nice passage. I'm just going to translate it uh, from French back into English, and, and I like this because I often quote that uh, 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 in front of the classical dilemma, the the purse of my life, the bourgeois will paradoxically be the one who would answer, uh, uh, take away my life, uh, but uh, leave me my purse. <laughs> Isn't that an <laughs> irony? And then I love that one. That's in French that I want to read. <laughs> so, in other words, he actually said how this bourgeois mentality, let's call it consumerist mentality now, this, because we are, we are actually dealing with the semantic slidings of so many words. This instant gratification, he was so viciously opposed against that I don't know if this man, he probably wouldn't commit suicide like many, like many intellectuals did uh, during his time, but he certainly would be a very, very unhappy man. Uh, after observing not just the states, but for that matter, the Western Europe itself. So yes, let's discuss a little bit more against this indictment of bourgeoisie and how, in fact, he comes up with that. And there are some passages where he makes uh, also strident comparisons between Bolshevism. He uses the word Bolshevism much more often than communism. What do you think? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with his essay where he re attacks uh, communism. Are you familiar with the passage where he attacks? Uh, where he actually denounces the proletariat, as, um, uh, how can I say, the embourgeoisement, that's a French word, the bourgeoisation of the proletarians. When they seized power in 1990, 1920 in the Soviet Union, of course, all those former quote-unquote proletarians became very rich. Uh, they became a new class, so to speak. Right, well, of course, he had... He understood that the ideal proclaimed by, by the Bolsheviks was the, the, the rule of the proletariat, but he also understood that was impossible. The lowest level of society is not capable of providing leadership. And uh, when the Bolsheviks won, it was, of course, because of middle class people like Lenin and people like that, who had perfect, perfectly good educations and, and read many languages and on and on, who then set up this bogus proletariat system, which in mm -hmm. fact was just another bourgeois system, because Absolutely. it was, it was imp the proletariat, the masses, cannot provide leadership. It's just not a, a, a politically possible thing. It's, it's, uh, there are some rules in politics and ethics that are like rules in physics. You can't change them. And, and leadership, as bad as the merchant class is, as, as the bourgeoisie, as leaders, they still have natural ability and intelligence. They just have low ideals. And when they take over and pretend to set up a proletariat system, as they did in the Soviet Union, it's just a joke because it's still going to be a bourgeois system. You still need leadership, even if mm -hmm. it's that kind of poor leadership. Well, uh, I'm sure from the morphological, we can say almost from the anthropological point of view, I'm sure you realize that he was, uh, he didn't see much difference at all between the communists, with, between Bolsheviks and the capitalists, so between bankers, or for that matter, Bolsheviks, we can put it that way. Well, he, what he saw in the capitalist system was what we saw in the 1930s and we're seeing right now, that you let these people get away with what they want to do and they ruin the country. Mm -hmm. Ironically, you'd think people who thought that the economy was everything and that finance was wonderful and free trade was great would be very good at that one issue. And the fact is they're terrible at it. They ruined well, it. People are more prosperous and successful in a in a religious and a warrior society than they are in a capitalist society. Well, I'm so glad you pointed it out. Could you just develop this thesis a little bit more, and we'll continue on that with his quote. Now, let's remember that for a lot of American history, there were real aristocrats who were running our society and keeping the the. Um, the, the economic class in control, but after World War One, for example, that fell away, and uh, we had a time where they simply ran wild, and it ended in one of the worst depressions, probably the worst depression we know of in world history. It was much less true in the in the 1990s, but there was an exactly comparable area where these people were basically all the restraints on them were cut away because they didn't need them. They were natural leaders. The market always justly distributes goods and resources where it belongs, and we had this. Uh, meltdown. 
and I don't think the meltdown now is as bad as the one in, in, in the 30s, but it still is a very comparable thing. And as everybody but the, um, the financial class themselves can see, it's because they were allowed to get away with things, because they're mm-hmm. not a leader class. They are a servant class, and once you let the, the ne- intelligent servants, they're not stupid servants like the proletariat, they're intelligent servants, but they're not leaders, and once you let the, the servants run the house, they start stealing the silverware and making a mess of everything. Mm-hmm. And that's what's that's happening here in the United States. That, that's a very good point, uh, Chris, indeed. And just for our starters, would you please clarify there is a substantial difference between the spiritual aristocracy and monetary aristocracy. And Julius Sevilla talks about this quite, quite, very, very much. And I'm sure, I don't, I don't want to think that uh, my, my listeners are not stupid, they understand those issues. But there are some people who, when you, when you utter, when you say the word aristocracy, they immediately think about, you know, it's, uh, aristocrats before the French Revolution. But basically this uh, concept of uh, aristocracy has a very, almost elastic meaning. I mean, I understand that our American founding fathers, they were true spiritual aristocrats, but they were not necessarily a materialistic, a monetary, or how can I say, pecuniary aristocrats. No, and they were not a, a traditional aristocracy in the sense that there were hundreds of generations of, of landowners. They were people who came over and devoted themselves to to uh, large farms, to plantations, to the free, they sacrificed much for their uh, for their people, they had strong uh, religious and, and, and military commitments. I mean, they were in every respect an aristocracy, except that they were almost all first or second generation successes. Mm-hmm. And uh, they believed very strongly and understood, and, and Adams and Jefferson write about this in their, in their correspondence, every society needs leaders. Those leaders mm-hmm. in society succeed have to be the best. But they don't, they're not necessarily the children of the best. Although in a, in, in a really excellent system, of course, gr- uh, great parents will bring up their children to be great. But that was not something that was relevant to the United States. They had come over from Europe relatively recently and were not part. And unfortunately, the French aristocracy went the other direction. They allowed mm-hmm. the bourgeoisie to educate them and to educate them out of their ideals and their, and their mission as a, as a true leadership class. Mm-hmm. And they, were no, they no longer functioned as a leadership class. Mm-hmm. And the bourgeoisie is able to overthrow them. Yes, so let's just follow up on that. I'm just uh, I'm here at this page, and there is this piece he wrote, actually a nice essay in 1940, Myth and Reality in the Anti-Bourgeois Battle. And there is this small, small extraction I'm going to read. I'm, trying, I'm going to try to translate it right away into English. Uh, I mean, uh, haven't we not seen, even in the communist uh, Soviet society, people of the very low extraction who manifest uh, uh, as soon as they come to power not only the worst traits of the corrupted bourgeoisie that they had previously vituperated but also indulged in orgies in debauchery. It's a wrong translation, but more or less you get an idea. So basically, isn't that isn't that a, what we? In fact, I observed. I saw it firsthand. You know, back in uh, when I grew up in communist Yugoslavia, this new class and, uh, and a former, literally former workers, former you know, uh, former nobody, nothing. You know, they all of a sudden became very very rich. Which brings me to my main point about this circle, this vicious circle between the bourgeoisie and, uh, and, this, um, and Bolsheviks. I mean, look at the neocons. I mean, I'm sure you know their pedigree. Let's forget about their, their racial pedigree and their ethnic pedigree. But their, their ideological pedigree hasn't changed a bit. In fact, they used to be Trotskyists, and now, what, now they become the what? The, 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 the most ardent supporters of free market. But in my view, this is, this is very logic. Can you, can, you, can you follow up on that? Can you, can you agree with that? There's a great consistency in their valuing the economy over other aspects of human life, in valuing uh, e- economic measures of success over other things. And when they were Trotskyites, they thought that the um, central government was going to be the, the best way to achieve these economic goals. And then as they converted to the two chairs for capitalism, they thought that the market, properly run, of course, by their friends on Wall Street, was the best way to achieve their economic goals. But the goals have always been economistic, have always been to measure a society by its economic success, not by its spiritual, intellectual, and military success. 
Uh, look what all the 68ers have, have turned into and what, what they have become over the last six, 40 years. I'm sure you know it firsthand. We know it both firsthand. Don't be Chris, you know. No, they, yes, they, of course. And they, it's very sad first, because it must be said, Trotsky himself was a warrior and, and fought. He, he, he's not afraid to fight, whereas these guys sit uh, in their in their rooms sending other people out to fight their wars. Well, you they openly one. defend as being for oil and for things like this, not for high ideals. Okay, Terrific. folks. Uh, we'll take a little break, folks, now, and we'll continue this fascinating discussion with uh, the prominent erudite and uh, my friend uh, Chris Kopf about uh, Evola, and not just about Evola, but this entire decadence that has swept over the white and western world. Don't go away, folks. Stay there. Welcome back, folks. This is Tom Sonic and with Dr. Kopf. Let's go back now to Julius Evola because he's our favorite for tonight, and we want to certainly discuss a little bit his relationship to Rosenberg. You know, to I'm sure you're familiar with Rosenberg and his myth of the 20th century, a famous National Socialist. He was a minister after all, and he had some mixed ideas about his. Uh, uh, we all already tackled on the topic about race. He talks more about the spiritual quality about the race and not the physical quality of the race. Could you please explain that? Because I guess for our quote-unquote racialists in the States, this is the most important issue. Well, one of the things he was very clear to him was that when you're dealing with thoroughbred horses or, or uh, finely bred dogs, uh, although there certainly is an element of spirit and intelligence in, in, in horses and dogs, the physical really explains most things. You can be satisfied, even though you know it isn't everything, with the spiritual. But for you, for, for the physical, excuse me. But with a human being, the opposite is true. The physical is just the foundation. And there is an intellectual, there is a, there, there is a question of, of, of soul, and there's a question of spirit, this widest of all and most insightful of all what really connects us with the transcendent and human beings need to be analyzed that way as well and a although there are human beings so degraded that a purely physical description of them is sufficient most human beings a human being really worthy of the name uh, really is something you need to take into account uh, um, soul and spirit and he was very insistent on this and very insistent of, of reje rejecting a reductionist view of uh, scientific uh, racism which tried mm -hmm. to reduce people to the purely physical side and ignored the, um, the, the, the soul and spirit. This is a very important point because I'm sure you're aware of this fact that the, even his friend who was Klaus Ferdinand Klaus, who was a famous uh, right. racialist scholar, German scholar, who was actually the alma mater, so to speak, in, in the Third Reich, of a, a, a widely quoted person. But he, he, he's quoting him as saying that race is not just a physical aspect. In other words, it's not just a phenotype. It's more to that. It's a spiritual. It's a spiritual value, and this is something that needs to be stressed and and and, and, uh, and over and emphasized to our listeners as well. Yes, among the great polemics that that uh, Evola got involved with in in the 30s was precisely over scientific racism, and he had very interesting articles on it. And it, it, it's fascinating because we think of a fascist country as Italy was then as one in which there's no debate, there's no discussion, and quite the contrary is true. There were terrific debates. Evola was not the only person who conducted them, but he was in the middle of several fascinating debates, the debate about whether or not the government should sign the concordat with the Catholic Church, the debate on, on scientific racism. These were exciting intellectual issues, which in many respects we can't have today. You mm -hmm. can't have a debate on this today. <laughs> we have to all be keep quiet about it and be afraid we'll be accused of something if we formulate sure. a vision in which race is a reality, but it's not the dominant Reality. It's not the ultimate reality. I'm very glad you exactly. pointed that out. Well, uh, look, you know, Chris, we know both of us, you know, since we're both in academia about self-censorship and uh, and this political correctness. I mean, this could take us hours and hours to discuss about that. But talking about race, uh, I'm very glad that you mentioned that because he was opposed to this uh, racial... In fact, you know, even if you look at his face, he didn't look very Nordic to start with. And this is another stupidity on the part, if you allow me, on the part of Nordicists and uh, whatever they call themselves, so <laughs> racialists, be it in the States or here in Europe, they think that you have to look like some Apollo or some god or what have you, which is nonsense because uh, uh, he, if you look at the phys physical traits of uh, Julius Evola, I'm sure you noticed a little bit of Mediterranean traits and different. So again, this is also something that needs to be put into perspective. 
But first and foremost, we got to read Julius Sevola to get those things because we've been both in, uh, in all of us, and the entire civilization has been bombarded by, with this liberal, you know, propaganda over the last six to seventy years. Yes, no, absolutely. The, the, the limits of discourse, when you see the limits of discourse in contemporary America and compare them with that of Italy in the 20s and 30s, you see there were many more things you could talk about and talk about uh, and debate. I mean, not just talk about, but have a real discussion where intelligent mm -hmm. people agree and disagree and present counter arguments than we have in our country, where it's a very limited number of policy issues and it's all talking points, not really mm -hmm. fundamental principles. Excellent, good point. Let me just clarify for our listeners who are starters, so to speak, who are undergrads, if uh, if you could clarify the issue between nationalism, I'm sorry, between fascism, the Italian fascism and national socialism, the role of the state vis-à-vis -vis the role of the people, the German word folk is trans wrongly translated into people, which is not exactly the same, and this is something that I'd like to talk to, and then at, at, towards the end we're going to look a little bit at the post-war Germany that he describes. Well, one area where Abel was quite clear in his own mind that, that, that fascism got it right, and he was critical of fascism when it was in power, and he also wrote on it uh, afterwards very clearly, but he thought the emphasis on the state was a very good thing. The state is a kind of intelligence. It molds the people. He felt the Roman people were created by the Roman state. He felt that uh, what fascism was offering to Italy was a kind of state that would create a true nation in, in that tradition. And uh, had he known more about the United States, I think he would have seen that the United States Constitution functioned very much that way in, in the United States. What he objected to in National Socialist theory was the idea that uh, das Volk was fundamental, that the people were fundamental and that the state was purely secondary and grew out of the people. He felt that was the opposite. Great leaders created a state, and the people were molded and formed into a great, if it was a great people, into a great people by great leaders, uh, who were the head of a great state, and he felt the, the theory behind National Socialism was mistaken. It was allowing the bottom, or at least something that is important and fundamental, but to be shaping. It was matter, not a form. And the state is the form of the people. So there is, in other words, there was a substantial difference between what we now, now this call with this generic word fascism, but there was a substantial difference between National Socialism and fascism, or for that matter, Frankism or Ustashism. There were different quote-unquote fascism all over Europe, correct? Yes, it's absolutely correct. It's absolutely correct. And they often differed on fundamental points, as Italian fascism and German national socialism differed on a number of fundamental points, including the role of the people and the role of scientific racism. And this is, listen, you are a scholar, of course, you are a teacher, professor. This is something that needs to be overemphasized in our school curricula, because people have no idea when they utter this word fascism, then they obligatorily think about something, uh, the synonym for the utmost evil, and they forget about, you know, the nuances, the political, the judiciary nuances, the geographical nuances among those different European countries, including, if you wish, you know, we had Hugh Long in, in, uh, in the United States, George Wallace, they were also quote Unquote, if you want to call them fascist in a net and pejorative sense, of course they were fascist. But they did in the original sense, they did also contain their rhetoric in their writings of Rockwell as well, some fascistic uh, point of views. And I think this needs to be also uh, clarified and explained in a scholarly fashion to our younger audience. No, that's absolutely right. Of course, the traditions of the European right are very rich. They're very various. The great German scholar Armin Moller liked to talk oh. about the conservative revolution, which is an intellectual movement different from National Socialism, different from Fascism, although some of its proponents participated in aspects of National Socialism and, and, and Fascism. The conservative revolution is, uh, the conservative revolutionary, and this is Junger, Spengler, people like this, uh, Gottfried Ben, including, uh, from Moller's point of view, um, Abel himself, are people who had an intellectual and principled vision and mm -hmm. were not part of a, you know, particular political, um, exemplification of uh, what was there. And it's one of the reasons why the European right is such an exciting and interesting group of thinkers. 
Mm -hmm. Let me ask you. You worked on you. You you, you look at the paperback books in Germany. You see books on conservative revolutionaries almost every year because there's still more to be gotten out of these people and their brilliant insights into the nature of man and the nature of the state. Uh, just in passing, it occurred to me. It's not quite related, but still, uh, did he know? Did he ever meet? Uh, Ezra Pound, because as you certainly know, Ezra Pound was in, in Rome during that time. He actually immigrated to, from the States to, 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 to Italy. Ezra and I think Pound, yep. Ezra Pound lived much of his life from the, from the teens through the late 1940s in Rapallo in, um, in, in northern Italy during uh, the 40s. He regularly went, came down to Rome and gave uh, radio addresses. Yeah. Did he ever meet a... People. Not to my knowledge, not to my knowledge, and I don't know, and I've, I've read widely, but not everything in both men, and I do not see any indication that Pound read um, Avila or that Avila read Pound. Yeah, that's very really fascinating. It's interesting because, after all, Pound was, even nowadays, among some Italian scholars, you know, Pound, Pound is venerated, appreciated. And I, you know, on a purely technical level, I'm surprised that they never met because the bottom line is they did share some, some, some common ideas as well. Yes, they did. And Italy was not that big a country back then. Um, oh, exactly. It, uh, it, it, it's a little bit strange because they're both very interesting people who took the past very seriously. Pound understood the classical traditions. He also admired China enormously. Uh -huh. I don't know that Pound was as interested in um, India as Avila was, mm -hmm. but Pound was very interested in China and Confucius, and he felt those traditions and the Roman traditions and the Renaissance traditions all were important for a fulfilled life in the 20th century. And he was also a linguist. And he had a very good, he was skilled for different languages. And he was a master, Italian. absolutely. He's a master of many languages. He so that's Chinese why he's very well. And of uh -huh. course, he's Italian. He, he wrote a number of works in Italian. And that's why I'm surprised on a purely personal level, because I've always had a weakness, and I've always admired people of, uh, of strong uh, uh, linguistic background, because uh, Evola, he spoke uh, German, he spoke, of course, Latin, uh, he wrote in those languages, he was a man, really, French, of course, you know, so uh, I'm really surprised that they never met, that somehow their paths never crossed, you know, <laughs> that's interesting, you know. Uh, again, it's just, this. Uh, I'd like to cover with you this very, rather sad and depressing essay of his that uh, was published in, uh, in and I think 57, let me see, Quo Quo Vadis Germania, where is Germany headed, you know, uh, it was, of course, it's in, it's in, in French that I read it, and uh, actually he, he wrote uh, rather pessimistically about, uh, about Germany, he says that it's becoming, in 1958 became very opulent again, even the living standard became higher than in 38, uh, it literally emerged as a phoenix out of the ruins, but then he also, I don't know if you're familiar with this essay, uh, he actually writes that uh, this, uh, this um, uh, dictatorship of well-being, or either this obsession with good food, good instant gratification, has completely uh, eclipsed the, the inborn German spirituality. And uh, if I can just ask you for your projections, I'm sure you're familiar with the situation in Germany, which is certainly much worse, you know, even on the judicial level, than in France and in America. It's a different, it's like a heaven and earth. How would you comment on that? You know, how, uh, well, it was interesting. He was looking for opportunities to continue what had been happening in the 20s and 30s. Uh, he also understood that you needed to be a fulfilled human being yourself if you're going to provide any kind of leadership, and he saw how brilliant the idea was to uh, head Germany, which had always been the great country and culture that stood up against 19th century liberalism, against free trade, against the uh, cult of the consumer, to, to, to create what was actually called by free market people the German miracle. This for a free market here is a miracle that the uh, German commitment to hard work and all the rest of it could be used to create a free market society that would be wealthy and consumeristic. And Evelyn had the insight to see that this was a better way to break the German people than, you know, conquering them and starving them and things that had happened at the end of World War uh, II, as everybody knows. That there were some really brutal actions that took place both by the Russians and by the Allies, uh, the other Allies. And... Um, it was much better to undermine them by turning them into a consumerist society um, than it was to just, you know, sort of 
put them into their own concentration camps. There are plenty of people recommending that as well. And he was discouraged by it because uh, this consumerism was, he saw it, at the heart of undermining not only a society, but the individuals themselves who begin to judge themselves on their economic accomplishments and not on their uh, on their spiritual, intellectual, and, uh, and, and ethical accomplishments. And he saw, it, he saw okay. it was a problem in Italy, too, of course. Well, Chris, wouldn't we all be, uh, agree with that, namely that the liberalism, uh, as a, a friend, Alan de Benoit wrote, uh, uh, destroys the, the, in fact, communism destroys the body, and uh, liberalism destroys the spirit. Uh, that's, yes. that's even, it's ten times that's worse. Exactly, that's exactly right. That's exactly and, right. Uh, it destroys the spirit of the individual, and it destroys the spirit of the nation. Because mm -hmm. I remember back in communist uh, Yugoslavia, we at least knew who the enemy was. It was difficult. It was Spartan. It was, you know, you didn't have exactly all those goodies that you have in the West. But at least we had this hope. And now you have nothing. You just turn into a perishable commodity in a perishable free market system. You just know that there were many tragic deaths in the Soviet Union, but there were also people like Solzhenitsyn who rose Precisely. out of it. And it's very hard to imagine a Solzhenitsyn arising in a free market society. In fact, when he came to America, when he was in exile, he didn't fit in. He was oh, he just was. as alien to American society as he was to the communist regime. I had a discussion with Dr. Devlin, I'm sure you're familiar with the gentleman, about Solzhenitsyn, and this is exactly what most uh, what most true dissidents went through. And in fact, uh, Solzhenitsyn didn't fit into the system, uh, the American system at all, because he was extremely very, he was very critical against this capitalist system in the first place. Yes, and, he was a great uh, traditionalist. He was a great traditionalist. Great tradition. So again, uh, before we wrap up, uh, uh, Chris, could you please tell us why is a uh, Julius Sevilla, a necessary read for our students, for our young American folks, for our friends, uh, and why? How can we best uh, uh, learn from him in, in in our future, in our days when we have to cope with this uncertain future? Well, two of the figures that have so influenced the modern world, even with all the criticisms, is is Charles Darwin, who persuaded the world that we were basically biological realities and everything else was second, and Karl Marx who persuaded that we're basically economic realities and everything else was second, and all of our woes of economism and materialism and feminism come from them, Abel is one of the great figures who stands up and says no. Spirit, mind, soul is above bi biology, um, the spiritual and the political and the warrior is above the economy, and he reminds us there's another kind of vision of human life, and it's a more fulfilling kind of vision of human life. It's one that can be the basis of a really uh, rich life, and it's the basis of a healthy and strong society. And he is very clear on this because he always talks about principles, and he knows exactly that uh, individual policies may go in different directions. But holding on to the great principles is the way for your own personal life and for the life of your society. Well, may I ask you, are you preparing some book or on, on Julius Sevel? Are you ready to give a lecture or speech on him? And I would be certainly more than willing to assist you with that and hook you up with some people who share the same interests. Good. Well, yes, I would. I, I, I think it's time for a book in English on, on Evola. There are books in Italian. There's a... Some very good books in French, uh, Christophe Boutin's Politique et Tradition, Politics and Tradition. I think it's time for a book in English, to so that people, and it's wonderful now so many of his books are being translated, that is great, but also a book about him that really says uh, not only what he says, but why it still matters, why someone who lived in the middle of the 20th century still speaks to us in the new century, and is going to continue to speak, because the things he talks about are of, you know, eternal ever-living, ever-relevant value. You know, I don't, again, it, you seem to me so modest. You don't have a website. I'm sure, you know, I get emails, and sometimes I find myself in an embarrassing position. Folks would like to find out about my interlocutor. How can I refer them to your splendid and fascinating work in your translations? After all, we're not talking about Mickey Mouse stuff. We're talking about years and decades of, of learning and studying and researching. So how can I actually alert my colleagues and my listeners to get in touch with you and, in fact, to, to read you? 
Well, yeah, as far as getting in touch with me, if you get to the University of Colorado webpage and type in my, my name, it'll, it'll give my email address, and it will give web pages that I'm connected with, the Honors Program and the Center for Western Civilization, where I'm the director. And as far as the stuff that I've done, uh, most of it's still in print. Uh, Amazon keeps it up. You can type my name into the Amazon.com uh, search engine or go to Intercollegiate Studies Institute, ISI.org, and type my name into their search engine. My book of reflections, uh, The Devil Knows Latin, Why America Needs the Classical Tradition, is uh, still available in its third paperback edition. I've recently done a translation of uh, important work by the German philosopher Josef Pieper, called Tradition, you believe wrong was the German title, which includes introductions by me and rather more extensive notes than, uh, than people put in, but which is a very important discussion of the centrality of tradition in a fulfilled human life um, from a person who was a very strong Platonist and uh, uh, knowledgeable in the, in the Western tradition of philosophy, but also so it wasn't just philosophy. It was a fulfilled human life needed mm -hmm. touch with tradition, and that's something that with all their differences, and there were a lot of them he shared with, with Avila. Yeah, you are a very unique person, you know, from the American point of view, because you're also a linguist, the translator, and I guess we I find lots of comparisons, lots of common points with you. Could you just give me a, a very short description? I, I, unfortunately, I haven't read it. I must admit, why the devil uh, reads uh, reads the Latin? Could you just give me the idea? What's the major? What's the main hypothesis? What's the main working theme? Uh, the main hypothesis, I would say, there 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 are two. One is that uh, despite all the talk about uh, progress and how things will never be the same again and how America uh, is an exception among all countries in the world, the center of human life, both personal and political, is based on the great long traditions that go back over millennia, and particularly in the case of that book, I, I concentrate on the classical tradition, the great ideals that come out of Greece and Rome, and continue to be an important part of American life, American society, uh, ranging everywhere from our form of government to the best sellers and the, and the best selling movies and uh, uh, the other things that, that are an important part of our life. And I, I talk about the, the sort of high political and religious implications of the classical tradition, but I also have a whole bunch of sections on movies and books and popular culture. Mm -hmm. We're also at that level. We still live on and, and enjoy and find satisfying contact with the classical tradition. Excellent. Uh, is this a valuable literature also for an undergraduate student? Would you suggest it to a, to a I noticed student? that it's that they keep it on stock in our university bookstore. Yeah, the, the, these were essays that range from essays written for the book, essays written for 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 chronicles and the intercollegiate review and modern age, and um, they are meant to sort of uh, be for an educated person, and undergraduates are people who are, in many cases, educated. I'm glad to hear that. On a personal level, on a rather logistical level, if I may ask you a question, Chris, would you be interested, tentatively speaking, of uh, uh, attending or rather, you know, participating at some conference, let's say with me, with probably Kevin McDonald or with Michael Hill and some other guys, and, and a sort of an interdisciplinary conference dealing with different issues of modernity, decadence and decay in our post-modernity. I'm just asking you a question. It's not a provocative question, I hope, but tentatively speaking, would you be interested to, to pitch in? Sure, it's a very interesting topic, and it's one where my background has a lot to, I think, contribute as far as historical perspective. We're talking about very brilliant people who, you know, are analyzing the problems of our contemporary world, and I think that what I can contribute to that kind of thing is putting it into a wider perspective and talking about the whole sure. range of where we, how we got where we are today. I'm not. I'm not trying to to denigrate other folks. There are other fascinating American scholars that I have, good friends of mine who are familiar with me. But the name Kevin McDonald came to my mind, and he could. I'm just tentatively speaking. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this because we talked about this on the phone the other day. We could have a conference where we don't just harp on one single issue because it gets boring after a while. We can look at, the, let's say, tentatively, decay and decadence in post-modernity. So we can look at, at it from the racial sociological perspective. We can look 
look at from the perspective of more modern history, his, 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 his historicity, like Michael Hill, who is a southerner, or you can look at, look at from your perspective, and I like looking from mine. And I'm, I think it might be a good idea, because, you know, I'm not too much into this fach idiotism, as the Germans say, this oh. pure expertise, because people get sometimes bored, especially the younger folks, because we don't want to talk to ourselves, we don't want to preach to the choir, you know, the word, we just want to spread the message around. And I feel, you know, I'll tell you, I'm a little bit angry at you and folks of your stature, because you are really a man of staggering erudition, and I, I'm sure you could show, and uh, you got something to sell, if I can put it that word. And I'm sure you would be willing to, if I can inform those folks, I'm sure you would be willing to 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 uh, to, to pitch in and to, to help us and uh, set up something. Uh, Sounds very interesting. Sounds like a great idea for a conference. I certainly will talk to Kevin shortly and to Michael Hill. I had him online the other day, and we were discussing about this, uh, different issues uh, from different perspectives about decay and decadence uh, in modern uh, in, and also in modern historiography. Well, thank you, Dr. Kauf. This was a fascinating discussion about you, Yusevola, and I hope that our uh, listeners will, will follow up on uh, your advice and my advice, and I hope that they will also be become a little bit more familiar with the heritage of Julius Evola and uh, his uh, fascinating work stretching from yoga to, to the description of modern decadence. And thank you once again, Chris, and uh, hope to see you next time in the United States. It was great to talk to you, Tom. I'm looking forward to seeing you here in the States. Thank you very much, Chris. Bye for now.